Hello, and welcome to our Sunday service for January the 31st, 2021. And my name is Ken Jackson. I'm the music director here at Central United. Um, just first of all, as an announcement, I would just like to uh, put out a, a, a hello to our Central United Church Choir. Um, because of COVID, obviously, we also have not been able to meet. And for people who are uh, involved in the arts and singing and theater, um, this has been a very trying time as well. And I hope that all my choir members are singing with me at home and singing every day. And we will have the acknowledgement of the territory. For thousands of years, indigenous people have lived on this land. As we gather for worship this morning, we acknowledge the first people of this land and the promises of Treaty 2 to live with respect on this land and to live in peace and harmony with its people. And as we gather, let us sing more voices 221, I am walking a path of peace. path of peace. I am walking a path of peace. I am walking a path of peace. Lead me home. Lead me home. I am walking a path of love. I am walking a path of love. I am walking a path of love. Lead me home. Lead me home. I am walking a path of grace. I am walking a path of grace. Our call to worship is a little unusual today as I've chosen, I've tried to ch choose uh, quotes uh, that I think probably say the words better than I could write. Our first quote is, beautiful music is the art of the prophets that can calm the agitations of the soul. It is one of the most magnificent and delightful presents God has given us. And that's by Martin Luther. Our next quote is, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and the tenement halls and whispered in the sound of silence. And that's written by Paul Simon. 
And our last quote comes from Lord Byron. The best prophet of the future is the past. Our next hymn is More Voices, number 172, God Says. God says, be still so you may hear the words I whisper in your ear. If you will listen, you will know I'm with you always where you go. God says, look up and see the prize. I placed here right before your eyes. Find beauty in the things of earth, a cause for wonder and rebirth. God says, come here, I need your voice. Please teach my people to rejoice in who you are and what you do. Your life will show my love for you. God says, reach out, the world's in need, and wants a word, a song, a deed. I send you forth to speak, to sing, to act for Christ in everything. Our Christ candle is lit, and as we watch its candle flame, let us think of these words. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. Francis of Assisi. And either Edith Wharton, the novelist, said, there are two ways of spreading light, to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. And at this time, let us say the prayer given to us, our Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We've been a while without a children's story, so I thought that maybe was, this was a good time to introduce one. The story is called My Brother Martin, and this coming month is also the month of black history. And I thought that this was uh, an appropriate book to share with you this Sunday, and it will uh, also fit the message later on in the service. Gather around and listen as I share childhood memories of my brother, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am his older sister and I've known him longer than anyone else. I knew him long before the speeches he gave, and the marches he led, and the prizes he won. 
I even knew him before he dreamed the dream that would change the world. We were born in the same room, my bro brother Martin and I. I was an early baby, born sooner than expected. Mother dear and daddy placed me in the chifferobe drawer that stood in the corner of their upstairs bedroom. I got a crib a few days later. A year and a half later, Martin spent his first night in that hand-me-down crib in the very same room. The house where we were born belonged to Mother Dear's parents, our grandparents. We lived there with them and our Aunt Ida, our grandmother's sister. And not long after my brother Martin, who we called ML because he and Daddy had the same name, our baby brother was born. His name was Alfred Daniel, but we called him A.D. after our grandfather. They called me Christine, and like three peas in one pod, we grew together. Our days and rooms were filled with adventure stories and tinker toys, with dolls and Monopoly and Chinese checkers. And although Daddy, who was an important minister, and Mother Dear, who was known far and wide as a musician, often had work that took them away from home, our grandmother was always there to take care of us. I remember days sitting at her feet as she and Aunt Ida filled us with grand memories of their childhood and read to us all about all the wonderful places in the world. And of course, my brothers and I eat, had each other. We three stuck together like the pages in a brand new book. And being normal young children, we were almost always up to something. Our best prank involved a fur piece that belonged to our grandmother. It looked almost alive with its tiny feet and little head and gleaming glass eyes. So every once in a while, in the waning light of evening, we'd tie that fur piece to a stick. And hiding behind the hedge in front of our house, we would dangle it in front of unsuspecting passerby. Boy, you could hear the screams of fright all across the neighborhood. Then there was the time Mother Dear decided that her children should all learn to play piano. I didn't mind much, but ML and AD preferred being outside to being stuck inside with our piano teacher, Mr. Mann, who would rap our knuckles with a ruler just for playing the wrong notes. Well, one morning ML and AD decided to loosen the legs on the piano bench so we wouldn't have to practice. We didn't tell Mr. Mann. And when he sat, crash, down he went. But mostly we were good, obedient children, and ML did learn to play a few songs on the piano. He even went off to sing with our mother a time or two. Given his love for singing and music, I'm sure he could have become as good a musician as our mother, had his life not called him down a different path. But that's just what his life did. My brothers and I grew up a long time ago, back in a time when certain places in our country had unfair laws that said it was right to keep black people separate because our skin was darker and our ancestors had been captured in far off Africa and brought to America as slaves. Atlanta, Georgia, the city in which we were growing up, had those laws. Because of those laws, my family rarely went to the picture shows or visited Grant Park with its famous cyclorama. In fact, to this very day, I, I don't recall ever seeing my father on a streetcar. Because of those laws and the indignity that went with them, Daddy preferred keeping ML, AD, and me close to home, where we'd be protected. We lived in a neighborhood in Atlanta that's now called Sweet Auburn. It was named for Auburn Avenue, the street that ran in front of our house. On our side of the street stood two-story frame houses similar to the ones we lived in. Across it crouched a line of one-story row houses and a store owned by a white family. When we were young, all the children along Auburn Avenue played together, even the two boys whose parents owned the store. And since our yard was a favorite gathering place, those boys played with us in our backyard. And they ran with ML and AD to the firehouse on the corner where they watched the engines and the firemen. 
The thought of not playing with those kids because they were different, because they were white and we were black, never entered our minds. Well, one day, ML and AD went to get their playmates from across the street, just as they had done a hundred times before. But they came home alone. The boys had told my brothers that they couldn't play together anymore because AD and ML were Negroes. And that was it. Shortly afterward, the family sold the store and moved away. We never saw or heard from them again. Looking back, I realized that it was only a matter of time before the generations of cruelty and injustice that Daddy and Mother Dear and Mama and Aunt Ida had been shielding us from finally broke through. But back then, it was a crushing blow that seemed to come out of nowhere. Why do white people treat colored people so mean? ML asked Mother Dear afterward. And with me and ML and AD standing in front of her, trying our best to understand, Mother Dear gave the reason behind it all. Her words explained the streetcars our family avoided and the whites only sign that kept us off the elevator at City Hall. Her words told why there were parks and museums that black people could not visit and why some restaurants refused to serve us and why hotels wouldn't give us rooms and why theaters would only allow us to watch their picture shows from the balcony. But her words also gave us hope. She answered simply, because they don't understand that everyone is the same. But someday, it will be better. And my brother ML looked up into our mother's face and said the words I remember to this day. He said, Mother dear, one day I'm going to turn this world upside down. In the coming years, there would be other reminders of the cruel system called segregation that sought to keep black people down. But it was Daddy who showed ML and AD and me how to speak out against hatred and bigotry and stand up for what's right. Daddy was the minister at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And after losing our playmates when ML and AD and I heard our father speak from this pulpit, his words held new meaning. And Daddy practiced what he preached. He always stood up for himself when confronted with hatred and bigotry. And each day he shared his encounters at the dinner table. When a shoe salesman told Daddy and ML that he'd only serve them in the back of the store because they were black, Daddy took ML somewhere else to buy new shoes. Another time, a police officer pulled Daddy over and called him boy. Daddy pointed to ML sitting next to him in the car and said, This is a boy. I am a man. And until you call me one, I will not listen to you. These stories were as nourishing as the food that was set before us. Years would pass and many new lessons would be learned. There would be numerous speeches and marches and prizes but my brother never forgot, never forgot the example of our father or the promise he had made to our mother on the day his friends turned him away. And when he was much older, my brother ML dreamed a dream that turned the world upside down. And that children's story is written by Christine King Ferris, who is the sister of Martin Luther King. Um, I encourage everyone at home to, in the next month or so, to check out our Facebook site. Um, I'm hoping to share some examples of uh, very wonderful and talented black musicians uh, through their music on our Facebook site during the next month, Black History Month. Our next hymn is Voices United 374, 
come and find the quiet center. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see. All the things that really matter Be at peace and simply be Silence is a friend who claims us Cools the heat and slows the pace God it is who speaks and names us Knows our being face to face Making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. In the spirit, let us travel, open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for heart to care. In the Spirit's lively scheming, there is hope Our first scripture comes from Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 20. A new prophet like Moses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will acquire it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And our second scripture comes from Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. But every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. As I was trying to think of something to say this morning, um, 
an idea sort of came to me, and a, a title sort of came to me, but I have to sometimes wonder when Mary reads my titles that she kind of wonders whether I might have uh, lost my sanity a little bit. But to this morning's message is entitled Prophets, Wolves, and Louis Riel. In May of 1875, a young man was exploring the wilderness near Washington, D.C. He was trying to get to the top of a tall hill. It was hard work, but when he reached the summit, he realized it had been worth the effort. The view around him, in front of his eyes, was beautiful. Being a religious man, having been brought up in a ro close Roman Catholic family, the man was inspired to kneel down and pray. All at once, the man was surrounded by a wall of fire. A voice came from the fire. It startled him. Rise, Louis David. You have a mission to accomplish for the benefit of humanity, said the voice. Why do you call me David? The man responded. I have no middle name. David is the name I give you as my prophet of the new world, the voice sounded. Where are you taking me? The man asked. I am transporting you to the fourth heaven to explain the nations of the world to you, the voice responded, and the man was whisked away. The passage I just read describes the illustrations in a graphic novel by Chester Brown. The man in the story is Louis Riel, a man who, by his own admission, had been given a task by God. Working as an educational assistant at Crocus Plains Secondary High School, I am most comfortable when I am able to assist students in an English or a history class. These are my comfort zones. Whether it is discussing the writer's craft in a poem or novel, or the investigation of the historical facts and personalities of an era of our world's interwoven history, these are the things that I enjoy. I am what people often refer to as a geek. Throughout my own schooling in middle school, high school, and then university here in Brandon, my exposure to Métis leader Louis, Louis Riel has changed over and over. At one point, the man was hardly mentioned. At another, he was touted as a villain, a renegade, a murderer. In university, he changed again, and we students were asked to consider whether he may be a hero maybe even a founder of Manitoba. Lately, there has been a conversation as to whether as a leader of the first provisional government of Manitoba, he may be thought of as our first premier. The one thing I was never asked to consider was whether he was a prophet of the new world. This idea is relatively new to me, and students are now asked what part of Louis Rail's religious convictions affected his actions, which in turn have greatly affected Canadian history, and indeed Canada itself. The word prophet is defined in Webster's as one who utters divinely inspired revelations, or the writer of one of the prophetic prophetic books of the Bible. 
one regarded by a group of followers as the final authoritative revealer of God's will, one gifted with more than ordinary spiritual or moral insight, an inspired poet, one who foretells the future events, an effective or a leading spokesperson for a cause, doctrine, or group. And finally, a spiritual seer. At first glance, Louis Riel does seem to fit much of this definition. Riel was an effective and inspired spokesperson for the Métis people. So much so that he left the safety of the United States where he sought sanctuary. When he was asked by Métis groups located in Saskatchewan to return to Canada in 1884. Following the resistance at Red River, Louis Riel lived in fear for his life as English Canadians, for the most part, held him responsible for the death of Thomas Scott, a member of a failed uprising at Lower Fort Garry. Yet, he came back. His self-described epiphany sounds like those experienced by other biblical prophets, such as Moses or David. Riel receives his marching orders in the wilderness, much like Moses. And indeed, his feelings for his people seems to mirror Moses asking Pharaoh to let my people go. Riel states that he was given the name David, and one also wonders about the connection between Riel and King David. Like the young King David, Riel seems to, at least for a short time, conquer the Goliaths of his time in negotiating an entrance for Manitoba into Confederation and a proposed safety for his Métis people. Psalm 34, David's psalm, begins like this. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The psalm was supposedly written when David pretended not to be in his right mind when he came before Abimelech. Riel's sanity would be questioned, too, upon his revelation of being a prophet. He was quietly placed in an asylum in Quebec by friends who feared for his sanity and his safety. Returning to Moses, he would also not see a promised land for the Métis like he hoped for when his Northwest Rebellion felled, and he ultimately paid the price with his life. As I continue to learn about Riel, and I am still learning, I don't see him as perfect. I believe he had his faults, as I believe we all have, and I believe all our prophets have. I don't believe that prophets are without faults because, as our passage from Deuteronomy points out, they come from among us humans, and we are far from perfect. Last week, we learned about Jonah and his doubts about bringing the bad news and how he tried to find a way to deliver his message without making things messy that doesn't diminish the good that people have the ability to accomplish. But whom should we follow? Do we always follow the right prophet? This is where the scripture from Matthew comes in. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, 
but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. I find Matthew's use of wolves in sheep's clothing interesting. When I was in university, many of my classes were in native studies, archaeology, and anthropology. I learned that often hunters would put on pelts or furs in order to disguise themselves from what they were hunting so that they could get as close as possible. Some animals use camouflage to disguise themselves from their prey, but it is humans who Matthew is talking about. And I don't believe he is talking about the hunt for food. It is the hunt for followers. There have been many prophets over time, biblical and likewise. They have not all been the ones that humans should follow. When Jesus spoke at the Mount of Olives, he said, And Jesus began to say to them, Take heed that no one leaves you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray. If possible, the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. And that comes from Mark 13. False prophets work for personal satisfaction and to gain, to lead astray. And unfortunately, we have been led astray many times. We have read the words that Adolf Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf outlining his idea of racial superiority and racial purity. And many followed David Koresh, who considered himself a Messiah figure leading up to a confrontation at Waco, Texas. The LGBT2SQ community has heard Reverend Jerry Falwell don the cloak of religion instead of wolf's clothing to raise money to produce a documentary outlining the gay conspiracy. And Reverend Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist went further, saying, slain American soldiers' deaths are God's punishments, and I'm sorry to use language that we would normally not use, for America's vague enabling ways. If you question the sanity of a statement like this by Reverend Fred Phelps, just consider that he ran for the Kansas Senate in 1992 and received 31% of the vote. And then we come to the last four years. In the last four years, we have witnessed the leader of a major world power utter everything from proposing ingesting dangerous chemicals to combat COVID-19 to stating that he was the most hard done president, harder done than Abraham Lincoln. He has also been touted as being sent by God to make America great again. The prophetic messages have taken the form of rambling tweets and have been supported by any person who decides to make an internet blog who gives him or herself the title of journalist. When an individual becomes a spokesperson for a community or a movement, we automatically ask for their credentials before considering what they are actually saying. Whether Louis Riel actually talked to God or not, he was advocating for human rights for the Métis people. Were all his end goals obtainable? Probably not, but the human rights he wanted certainly were. 
People were able to dismiss Riel's dream of a promised land simply by not believing that God would talk to someone like him. So again, who should we follow? Well, what about the Martin Luther Kings, the Nelson Mandela's, the Maya Angelou's who preach racial tolerance and equality? What about the Archbishop Oscar Romero's or the Dalai Lama's who preach for peace? What about the Greta Thunberg's and Jane Goodall's who preach support for the environment and all its species? What about the Sylvia Rivera's, the Marsha P. Johnson's, or the Judy and Dennis Shepherds, who have preached about the unnecessary violence shown to and the equality rights deserved by the LGBT2SQ community? What about the Stephen Lewis's who speak out for AIDS assistance in Africa? What about the Terry Fox's who run for a cure to cancer? What about the Senator Marie Sinclair's and yes, Louis Riel's who preach for indigenous rights and the rights of indigenous women and children? On January the 6th, 2021, I witnessed a president inciting violence against the democratic government of the United States, citing unsubstantiated claims of election fraud in hopes of saving his job. This past week, I read an article about a man who set up his portable fishing hut in order to keep an elderly homeless man alive in the paw and who is organizing volunteers to help keep their homeless shelter open 24-7. My question for you is, which prophet would you follow? Better yet, when you get the chance, what kind of prophet will you be? Amen. At this point, I'm going to be taking a little bit of time off. I'm not going away, don't worry. Um, but we are very blessed to have uh, playing for us this morning Heather Clausen, who is going to be playing a special piece of music for us this morning called Moon Over Birkenau by Steve Bell.
Thank you very much, Heather. That was beautiful. At this time, I'd like to thank you all for your support of Century United Church during our COVID-19 journey. And I would like to offer this offering prayer that comes to us from uh, our gathering magazine of the United Church of Canada and was written by Laura Turnbull from Penticton, BC. God of great abundance, we have cast our nets wide and the hall is astounding. Grant us faith that we might maintain this conviction. May our giving, givings be generous and our commitment be extravagant. We make our offerings with great joy. Amen. And our closing hymn this morning is Voices United 649, Walk With Me. And in closing, these words from Archbishop Oscar Romero. Peace is not the product of terror or fear. Peace is not the silence of cemeteries. Peace is not the silent result of violent repression. Peace is the generous, tranquil contribution of all to the good of all. Peace is dynamism. Peace is generosity, it is right, and it is duty. As we go forth this week, let all of us remember that we all have the ability to be prophets for a better world. Let us go and go and make a difference. Go make a difference. Make a difference, go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make 
make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world.